through the tracery of old wrought iron, lace work from a long forgotten blacksmith's hammer to edge a hallowed or historic plot. Or from a modern vantage point aloft, it is a place of patterns along the harbor front or in the northwest arm reserved for pleasure craft or down quiet streets of comfortable homes. The patterns bear, in iron and ancient bronze and weathered stone, the hallmarks of history. On every side endure reminders of a proud past, rich in tradition and the accomplishments of peace and the old triumphs of half-forgotten war. From the eastern bastions of the citadel, one faces the ocean and the dawn. Here, an hour before the rest of North America, the new day rises from the sea to gild the bridge and silhouette the old town clock and masts of fishing craft along the waterfront. Now, as has always been the case, Halifax lives by its waterfront and seaborne commerce is its breath of life. At the four quadrants of the compass, the city is built on the steep slopes of a hill that rises to the citadel and rises from tide water. Much that is new has grown in recent years, but as in the past, the roots of growth are fed and nurtured by the sea. The fishery and seaborne trade built Halifax and builds it higher every year. The heart of the city is the Grand Parade, and from that heart, the visitor is warmly welcomed. And there is much of interest here to browse and see at a comfortable pace, and in an atmosphere of old world courtesy that many modern cities have lost along the way. Barrington Street, the main thoroughfare, boasts fine department stores, and two, the shops of specialists with many colored merchandise such as these Nova Scotia tartans in fine wool, the official tartan of the province, made up in a wide range of garments for the young and serious, and for the not so very old and gay. And in the Grand Parade, a place of memory, Two world wars that raged across the nearby sea came perilously close to home at times and left their marks on the old face of Halifax. In 17, a munition ship blew up, killed thousands, threw its anchor stock some three miles inland. Province House that Charles Dickens hailed as a jewel of Georgian colonial and Westminster in miniature, housed the first responsible government in all of Britain's empire overseas. Joe Howe, who stands nearby in bronze, won that privilege for his native province. The constant contrasts of old with new add sparkle to the patterns of the city. And the founding father, Edward Cornwallis, looks down in wonderment at the changes of 200 years and how the inns have grown and prospered since his day. The harbor's northwest arm, when Cornwallis first sailed in, was called, the Indians said, Wagwaltic, and that name lives on along the city's western shore in the famed Wagwaltic Club, where succeeding generations of Haligonians learned to swim. But the WAG is just the finest of many fine swimming and boating clubs. For few cities in the world have such a sea-girt site or are so well provided with public beaches. And hundreds of Halifax homes have tide water at the bottom of the garden. Public baths and favorite, if informal, swimming spots abound in both the harbor and the arm. As 
As at the Wagwaltic, many of the city's fine tennis courts belong to the boating and bathing clubs. And a hot game of tennis, followed by a cool saltwater swim, is an old ritual in the Citadel City. At the harbor's seaward end, the amateur sailors observe the age-old rites of spring with paint and varnish, sandpaper, and a lot of elbow grease as they carry on the best traditions of Nova Scotia's great seafaring past. The hulls are ship-shaped when they take the water for the long summer sailing season. Even the youngsters catch the spirit of the launching time. The snipes, always the first to float in spring and the last to haul out in autumn, begin their racing season early. These are the training craft for the city's strength of yachtsmen. And with a snipe, it's great fun while you're learning. As spring wears into summer, the larger craft appear, and weekends in the harbor and the arm see sails in hundreds. Yachts in a score of types and classes are everywhere you look in summertime, close hauled to the wind or running before light airs flying a nylon spinnaker of red, blue, or green. They add a sparkle to the seaward sea. But the contagious urge for speed is felt here too. For those who would go faster than the wind, power boats are myriad in number. And this one might expect in Halifax. For here on Water Street, one Samuel Cunard found sail too slow and dreamed his dream of ships that would be driven on by steam and founded his world-circling shipping line. Nearby Lily Lake is a favorite spot for power boats and the outboard experts come from miles around to test their skills as tinkerers and drivers. Okay, the right adjustments made the right mixture in the tank. And with a roar, they're off. terminal waiting to carry the products of our farms and factories to the world. Ships of the seven seas flying the flags of every nation and house flags of every steamship line. And up the harbor are the fish piers and the packing plants. A swordfish boat unloads while on the wharf, the handlers rake in cod and haddock and halibut. This is one of the world's great fish ports. And from here goes processed fish by shipload to the world. This, along with general cargo, going out, coming in. Old Water Street exudes a racy tang an old and seasoned essence, best enjoyed to the sound of rattling winches. Here calls all that floats, ghosts from a distant past, white and rigged square, or the modern transatlantic liners and the coastwise summer cruise ships come and go. And to find new homes and a brighter future in the new world, the ships bring new citizens from Europe's teeming shores. Here they first feel the good earth of Canada beneath their feet. Halifax is the nation's welcoming hand.
On Navy Day, the harbor has a festive air, and the old gray dockyard blossoms like the rose. Miles of flags and bunting and gay summer hats and dresses. Wrens in their whites, the sailors in white tops. Frank smiles of welcome from the fleet, as the Royal Canadian Navy is at home to the city and its visitors. And day long, the townsfolk go alow and aloft, aboard and ashore. Bangs from the stream and bands on the jetty add the sounds of carnival. The U.S. Coast Guard visits too aboard their bark eagle. They have the old-time sailor style on the shrouds and backstays and a true sailor style ashore. All the nice girls love them, but this is a new approach. Next door neighbors to the Navy is the shipyards, busy as always building new destroyers or repairing merchantmen. This was the great maintenance and refit yard of World War II that kept the damaged convoys going eastward. Now, peacetime commerce keeps employment high. The Army has always shared the task with the Navy of keeping Halifax the Warden of the Honor of the North. And as well as being a great naval base since Cornwallis landed in 1749, this has been a garrison city. Inside the battlements, the earthworks and the moat of the old citadel, the Princess Louise Fusiliers mount ceremonial guard, where once the Imperial regiments paraded for their commander-in-chief, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, and father of Queen Victoria, who planned and built this mighty fortress on the hill. A museum housed in what has long been a museum piece. Deep in the walls and bastions of the citadel, the Nova Scotia Provincial Museum exhibits rare antiques, object d'art, old paintings, and the tools of living that date from the city's early days. Visitors by the thousand pass through this unique system of buried rooms and underground passageways each year. And most agree that the atmosphere, the surroundings and exhibits are not to be matched on this continent. The massive stonework itself, recently restored to its original perfection, is worth a journey up the hill. leave the past now for the sunlight of the lively present. At Sackville Downs, the trotters and pacers remind one that the first horse races in Canada were a regular thing on the North Common between the blooded mounts of the first garrison's officers. Once again, they're off and running. Guess who holds a ticket on the winner? Sackville Downs provides one of the nation's most exciting dirt tracks for stock car racing. These heaps may have seen better days, but none that were faster. Exciting and educational. Here you can learn how to cope with the five o'clock rush.
Fairfax is proud of its homes. The stately mansions of Young Avenue, five minutes from the heart of downtown, or the newer homes and gardens of the city's western slopes that face the arm. Nonconformist and one of a kind, they are often set in groves of silver birch. And when the autumn comes, it's a happy chore to clear up the scarlet and golden litter of another year. This is a university city too, and south and west in the residential areas are set the colleges in their spacious lawns. The Dalhousie campus shared by King's College, Canada's oldest seat of higher learning the Georgian fieldstone facade of Sheriff Hall, the ladies' residence. And in contrast, the new vocational school on the South Common, as modern as tomorrow and the subjects that are taught here. and the clean lines and pale gray Nova Scotia granite of St. Mary's College. They all proclaim the city's interest in and respect for scholarship. When the city was founded, land had little value and an all but empty continent stretched westward 4,000 miles. So the planners were prodigal in declaring open ground for parks. To this day, it is one of the world's most open, airy cities, with its citadel, vast commons, college campuses, playgrounds, and church property. But in the public gardens at Midtown, we have a jewel of unique beauty. A vast space of flowers, and flowering shrubs, and tinkling fountains, and pleasant walks, and room for quiet rest. While on the nearby common, the youngsters can go boating on the egg pond, as it's called, in craft that try their best to discredit Nova Scotia's great shipbuilding tradition. But it's grand fun all the same. As is the swimming pool, when city streets get hot in summertime. Or the wading pool, for small fry who can't swim. The area abounds in fun and game, the swings and slides, and a great favorite with the youngsters is the roundabout, and it's all under an unobtrusive supervision. Ashburn, the city's own golf club, is one of Canada's most beautiful. It rises above the northwest residential slopes, and on the upper tees, the view of the city and the sea beyond is such that visitors have been known to have trouble keeping their heads down and an eye on the ball. A sporty course it is, a real test of golf with lots of trouble on all sides for the careless. The hookers and slicers claim that the rough, so often thick with silver birches, make it almost a pleasure to get off the fairway. Well and fairly trapped greens can slow down even the experts, but a missed putt must be blamed on the player, for this climate grows as fine a putting green as you will find. Unique of its kind in Canada, this troop of young equestrians, the junior Bengal Lancers, maintain their paddock and training ring on the South Common and work toward the day when it can be said that they match stride for stride the precision and the horsemanship of the world-famous musical ride of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And the Mounties can start worrying any time now. They're coming closer by the day. High over the city, in the upper earthworks of the Citadel, 
now stands Canada's memorial to the sailors lost at sea in two world wars. Here, on the highest ground for miles around, a grateful nation has inscribed their every name. And washed by the winds of the ocean and the sea rains in the night, lit alike by the last fires of sunset and the first rays of each seaborne dawn, at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.